Hello everyone. Hello everyone. Welcome to Force 4G 2021. This is the afternoon of Thursday in Humapaca Zone. And next we will be having Ivan Sanchez. We Who have, yeah. I have a very technical or very academic sounding uh, talk. If you want to say the name, Joshi. <laughs> yes. Techniques for representing untal GIS data in WebGL. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, That's a tongue twister. Actually. It's a yeah, it's a mouthful, definitely. Yeah, but let's uh, let's start. Let's put my slides on and let's go with it. So, hi everybody. I'm Ivan. I'm doing word gel things. Uh, I want to say that this talk is going to be heavy on the computer science uh, part of the of the GIS component. I'm I this is going to be hard to understand if you are more of a natural sciences person. Uh, again, be advised, this has some hardcore computer science concepts uh, thrown in. Uh, this is not the first time I do a talk like this. I realized looking at my archives that I did a similar one back in 2016 where I just explained my what I learned from fumbling around and trying to make WebGL work. So if you have the time and curiosity it's a good idea to uh, to look into video archives for the Phosphor G in Bonn and watch it. Okay, so a bit of context. Uh, I have been doing leaflet maintenance for a while now, since I was kind of upgraded to a maintainer because I was doing some back fixing in the core. And these days, this is my personal opinion. I want to remark it's a personal opinion. It's okay if you don't think like me. I'm pretty sure that the open layers falls, you know, think differently, but this is my personal opinion. Uh, leaflet, I can understand it from the from start to end. Uh, I just can do HTML elements, work with them, mess them around. It's absolutely wonderful, but I'm kind of burnt out from it. Uh, there hasn't been any actual tangible support for maintaining leaflet. Everybody wants to use it. Everybody thinks that it's awesome. Nobody really wants to work on the hard uh, bugs that it's plaguing. Plaguing it's maybe a bit heavy word, uh, but the code base it's aging and not too well, and it needs some heavy work. And nobody really wants to do it. Now, Mapbox has the Mapbox GL2 library, but Mapbox has been losing a lot of. Uh, Floss Karma in 2021. They uh, closed sourced uh, Mapbox GL2. They have also uh, some union busting uh, rumors, which are not something too good. And uh, they have lost a few points in my scorecard. Uh, other than that, we have uh, some uh, other mapping libraries, such as OpenLayer, System, MapLayer GL, which all use WebGL and they are absolutely fancy and they work fast. Unfortunately, I cannot make heads or tails of the architecture, and then I feel like an idiot because I'm supposed to know how web maps work, and I cannot, for the love of me, understand how open layers of map libre work internally, not to talk about Cessium. So I have been trying for years to try and make a web map library using WebGL that I can understand at least, and failing miserably to do so for years on end. I have been learning more things as time has gone. Um, this is the main takeaways I want to present today. Uh, OpenGL is not uh, object-oriented programming. The GPU is a peripheral, and I can do some tricks to handle uh, the problems derived from floating point arithmetic, the anti-meridian, and raster meshes. So part one of five, this is not object-oriented programming. Uh, I said this already in 2015, so I'm, I'm really still angry about this, really angry. Okay, in any programming language, or in any well-known programming language, the way you deal with data structures is pretty much the same. You create a data structure, and then you can just put a value in some particular uh, particular position or particular um, point in, inside that data structure. This is all fine. And if I know one programming language, I will instantly understand any other programming languages that look similar in this case. It's all the same, really. The only difference is that in JavaScript, the things are empty, and in C, Rust, the things has, uh, have a explicit type. The whole concept is the same. And this is, uh, this, uh, these are programming languages, which means they have a syntax, they have semantics, so uh, they form 
actual language constructs that are there to be understood by people. You know, subject, verb, or object. This I can understand. I know that the operation is doing something on the subject. That's it. This is like basic understanding of programming. It's kind of too obvious, but that's it. Now, when you are dealing with uh, either OpenGL or WebGL, the API is so convoluted in my opinion that it goes the extra weird way to do something like, I want to create five, uh, some place to store five numbers and I want to set the second number five. So I have to do all that things, all those things that have nothing to do with either the second, uh, th there's no number five and there's no number two in all that code, which is extra confusing because you have to assume the data type before you actually create the data structure, which is even C is better than this. So it just it gets me angry every time. Uh, so if we think of programming languages as languages, and I look at this specific um, sentence, this specific uh, yeah sentence, what is the subject in that sentence? Because that's gl.buffer subdata. So I'm storing some subdata in a buffer of that context, but that buffer is an entity in itself. I have created a buffer uh, just before with this thing, and I have stored it in, 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 in this variable. So why am I not using that thing instead? Why I have to bind the buff and then see as active and then do operations in that one? It just doesn't make any sense to do an operation in something that is completely unrelated. That breaks encapsulation. It, uh, it just, it's bad. It's not an object. People in, the, in OpenGL books and uh, literature call a buffer a vertex buffer object with the O at the end. And I say, this is not an object. This, is, this does, not feel, does not follow any of the object-oriented object programming guidelines or concepts. It's incredibly confusing. It's a syntactic share problem. It's not a hardware problem or architecture problem. It's syntactic share. A compiler can take care of this. However, in my personal experience, every time I try to complain to the OpenGL people about this fact, you know, with a proper academic discourse about lack of encapsulation in WebGL structures is kind of cumbersome, and I would like this to be other way because this is the response I get: direct mode. Dude, you don't understand this because direct mode is good. And he's like, I don't even have the time and energy remaining to explain that this is not about direct mode, it's about syntactic sugar. This is how it feels when I'm talking to OpenGL people. It feels bad. And I think this is a roadblock in the way to understand the, the whole technology. So in the end, I made a whole abstraction library to try and overcome these problems. I'm going to put a link there so you can uh, see if, you, if, uh, if you have the time and curiosity for it. Uh, so instead of having a buffer, which I just will do crazy things with binding the active or whatever, I can define a data structure which makes sense. I can understand this. This is a, a variable size data structure with uh, in which every of the items is a three vector component. So I can store a three vector component in any um, in any position, which this has a proper syntax and a proper semantics. Okay, for 205, oh my God, have I eaten already eight minutes? I am doing bad. The GPU is a peripheral. Uh, this is, this is, uh, this has to do with how memory is handled by computers. Uh, anybody with knowledge about computer science knows that there's a thing called my memory hierarchy because different types of memory technologies have different access times and throughput and capacities. Well, capacity is really a function of price, really, but you know, you cannot have a million dollar RAM chip everywhere. So this is how it usually goes. CPU registers are like maybe 10 to 20 numbers. Uh, so, so you can understand me, L1 and L2 cache is a, it's a few thousand numbers. Then you know RAM, it's a few million or a few uh, milliard. And then you have hard drives, which is as much as you can afford because it's kind of inexpensive. The interesting thing that I want to focus on is that accessing the different kind of memory have different times. This is the latency. I'm not talking about throughput. I'm talking about latency, which is the time, uh, the time to reach that, uh, that part of hardware and then come back with the result. 
these are typical times. I like to put it here because I can see the uh, the uh, magnitudes in a better way if I just uh, align everything. Uh, there's jumps in the magnitude when you go from the CPU to outside of the CPU chip into the RAM, and then another very big jump when you go outside of the RAM and into actual um, permanent storage. Uh, this is important because we computer scientists know that if we're handling things in memory, it's also it's really fast. Uh, memory packs come uh, efficiently. There's something called the uh, spatial cache uh, neighborhoodness. I forgot the name, but it's when you are uh, storing things uh, next to each other in a data structure, it all hits cache and you don't have to go to RAM. You hit uh, one cache and then everything ex uh, is ejected together. So it's say this is uh, this saves time. You can even assume l uh, lower numbers for that. When you are doing the same-ish thing to permanent storage, you are opening a file and you're going to write five letters to it. Each of those uh, write operations is going to take 20 milliseconds because this is blocking or uh, at least your program has to wait until the operation is finished because that's how it usually works unless you are pulling some tricks. Even though I'm doing Technically saying, which is storing five values in a data structure, the fact that one of those data structures relies directly on a different hardware technology has a direct impact on how much time you spend doing those same five uh, operations. So, you know, it's way better. If, instead of putting one uh, five letters uh, in five consecutive actions, it's way better to concatenate all those five letters in memory uh, and doing that concatenation will take some time and will take some uh, time to write it in memory, but it's way faster because you only did one slow operation, which is the important thing when you're dealing with latency. You have to pack things and prepare for the bus transfer and stuff like that. The important thing here is that the GPU is a peripheral. It is connected to a bus in your motherboard. It has a higher latency than your RAM. So every time you are storing one value in the GPU memory, you have to go all the way and back, uh, especially since we're using WebGL. WebGL has an extra constraint, which is you, uh, you cannot do this asynchronously. You cannot queue this. Uh, whenever you make a call, you have to wait for the, the call result. So this latency is real. Uh, so when dealing with WebGL specifically, when you're going to store some pieces of data in several positions, which by the way are not 0, 1, 2, 3, 5, it's 0, 4, 8, 2, 16, because each of those you have to know in advance that they are 4 bytes each. Fun. This, the possibility of typo just explodes. Uh, the, the one at the um, left is five times slower than the one at the right. Even if the one at the right involves doing more work in RAM, it will have only one problematic or one slow operation. Uh, in other words, if I'm using my fancy uh, understandable library, instead of doing six operations to store six different three component vectors, I would like to do one uh, store operation. So this will shave time. Um, I think I'm, I'm not gonna be able to show this. Uh, it's possible to do some timings in the browser with uh, two of these different approaches. Um, when I'm doing this approach, uh, I'm going to do which is the one from the... I don't have the coastline example open. I don't have the coastline example open. I want the coastline example because I did this yesterday. So if I'm loading a big data file and then I'm adding all the symbols together, is way faster than if I would be adding the symbols one by one because in this case, I will be calling this thing a lot of times, and each time I add something to the map, it will write into GPU memory, and that starts being slow. So it's important to cache and put together all the things you can in advance. OK. Uh, well, I just showed this on the core editor, so I'm not going to mention anything except that map has several meanings when you're dealing with functional programming in GIS. Um, by the way, I am very angry at the amount of meanings of the word layer. I hate that you can layer a layer of a layer in a layer of a layer. So yes, we're doing maps of maps. Why not? Floating point arithmetic. OK, uh, people who don't know about computers think that computers are magic and can do incredible math, and they can't. 
Computers do not understand equations. They do not understand calculus. They suck at that. You have to think them as calculators. If you don't get why 80,085 is a joke, good for you. I'm getting away with this. So please do think that every number that you put into a computer is a number that has to be shown in the LCD screen of an old calculator with a limited amount of digits. And if the number becomes too big or too uh, small, you will start adding the scientific notation at the end. Like uh, this means uh, times 10 to the ninth power, for example. This is the very easy way to understand why numbers in computers don't are, are not always what you think they are. Uh, the floating point number thing means that whenever you have a point, you have to think or you have to imagine that the point floats around the number. So you have a set amount of digits to work with, and then the point can go in and out, even away from the screen, which is when the scientific notation happens. OK, the problem with this is, for example, you have a, a calculator with four digits on the screen, and you want to sum 9,999 plus 5, for example. The number does not fit on the screen. You have to drop something. So that drop something is going to mean that you are going to have like 1.0 times 10 to the fifth power, which is 10,000, and you have to drop a digit there because it will not fit in the screen. That's the point. What's the issue with this? That WebGL and OpenGL2, uh, they are all technologies, and all the numbers that they use, you have to assume the worst case scenario, which is flow 24, which is 16 bits of precision, which means five decimal digits. It sucks. It really sucks when you need to store big numbers because you start losing position because you have to drop everything here. Uh, in JS specifically, um, in uh, I guess you know where this monolith comes from, and those are the coordinates in UTM. So if I want to store those UTM coordinates in a WebGL buffer as floating point numbers, I will have to drop some digits. I can only store 4.8 digits. I'm going to round that up to five digits, some precision is going to be shaved around. So I cannot store the um, precise position. Uh, this is not accuracy. This is precision, which uh, precision and accuracy in different terms. Uh, I will be dropping at least 10 meters of precision from the longitude and at least 100 meters of precision from the latitude. No, I'm dropping 5 and 50. I'm dropping the half of it because I'm rounding that thing. Anyway, it's bad. How can we work around this? False easting and false northing. This is the wonderful crazy idea you have to keep in mind. Instead of just storing the original coordinates, you create, you create a different coordinate reference system, which is the same reference system that you're using, but with a different easting and northing, or false easting and false northing. And in, in this case, I can say, hey, my false UTM 21 south is going to be it's going to have a false northing of 300,000 and a false easting no the other way around a false easting of 300,000 and a false northing of 6.1 million and in that case the numbers i have to store are can fit within the precision limit and i can work with this um, i will try and show this really 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 fast uh, here this is an example with uh, this is the Two example, come on, this is the offset example. I'm just storing things around this number, which is the magic crossing point of, of, the, um, of the position limit. So if I do not do any fixes, this is how it will work. The data starts to clamp together and uh, things start to not work as you expect and the uh, polygons start to look jaggy and things are not good. This is how it should like every pixel should have the same difference between them. This is how it starts to look like. Things clump together. Your uh, arithmetic starts to round up in weird ways, and your map display is wrong. And that's a problem. OK, so going on. The thing with tiled data and why tiled vector data works wonderfully with WebGL um, frameworks is because tile corner is an implicit false error or nothing. So all the coordinates within a tile, a vector tile, are relative to the tile, not absolute to the CRS. 
that's why it's way easier to, to do this. And that's why I have to go a bit uh, around the uh, walked path to find a solution to non tile data. Uh, also, when you move the map away from the, the uh, center of the series, you have to recalculate everything. This is easy if all your series data is in a specific buffers, so you can uh, you need only to change the buffers with the series, apply in the offset, or recalculate it together if you're doing a full regression. But the point here is that whenever you are far too away in terms of longitude, latitude, or zoom level scale, you have to reproject everything into the new false uh, series in order for it to look nice, which is the thing I do in my in my uh, code. Uh, anti-meridian, uh, we all know the anti-meridian as why is my map bad on the border of Russia and Alaska? Why is Russia broken in two? I don't understand why this happens. So the approach to uh, fix this is uh, the leaf that we're thinking, which is uh, there can be coordinates in a CRS outside of the limits of a CRS. I will, however, keep in mind how much I can I need to wrap coordinates if they fall off the anti-meridian. Uh, this is a very simple algorithm. If the first coordinate is further away than the series origin, origin I wrap, I wrap the, the coordinate. If the nth coordinate is further away than the n minus one coordinate, I wrap it. I'm going to try and uh, show this. Uh, yes, with this example, this is uh, this is already being fixed. So I'm not, this is fixed. I don't want to fix this. I want the coordinate system to not have the, uh, wait, I need to reload. And yes, I want the coordinate system to not rub the things around. This is my original data, okay? I have one line from 170 to minus 170, and one line from 180 to one, uh, where are you? This is the coastline example. This is my data from 170 to minus 170 and from 190 to 200. And this is how it looks like if I don't care about dropping anything around. If I do care about dropping things around, I can come on things and reload and things will start to look like, uh, to look like I expect. Still, I will be having this thing, uh, this thing here, uh, but it's a minor artifact compared with the problems of having uh, data across the whole map. Also, if I just go to the other file and uncomment this trick here, what I do then is every layer, every acetate, uh, every kind of symbol in this map, I will calculate the bounding box for, I think that's like for this. Yes, this is my data example here. So I will calculate the bounding box of this moved translated data and it will work as we expect. I'm just redrawing everything several times. Uh, probably easy to do. And then raster meshes, since we are a bit short on time, I will just say that I did a, a raster mesh library. And uh, be, just as before, I will be copying the link. And you will be seeing this link in the past, because I'm one from the future. And that's all. <laughs> Thanks for. <sighs> Thanks for being awake during this crazy fast talk. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ivan, for your talk. We were done a little, but I think we have time for one question at least. Um, this one, for example, have you looked at the new web GPU standard? And do you have any opinions about it? I, I haven't. I haven't looked at it in depth. I am scared that it's repeating the errors of the past in regards to data structures. I should look at it, but I don't have the time to look at it. Uh, my, my priority is rather to look into things that have much wider support in current web browsers at this time. Uh, also, I cannot... Uh, I don't want to go into discussions with the people implementing the WebGPU standard because I risk getting really angry with the people who are trying to design it. And I, there's, there's no benefit for me to spend a lot of time going into the discussions about the WebGPU design. So not yet, maybe in the future, but first WebGL2. 
I need to understand WebGL2 and all the changes and implement framework around that and try to push this math framework forward. And then I can start thinking about WebGPU. Uh, I one of the one of my concerns with WebGPU is that I'm not sure how easy or how straightforward is it to dump WebGPU data into a visible frame buffer, i.e., into your screen. WebGPU is, I think, from what I can gather, more oriented at processing data, not displaying data. Uh, you put a bunch of binary data into the GPU, you get a bunch of binary data into the GPU, you don't get an image. As far as I am aware, I might be wrong on this. Uh, maybe we have time for another quick question or two? Yes, I think. Uh, we have one, uh, someone is asking if your WebGL map library or any of the demos are public. I think so, they are in Glee library. Uh, no, this is uh, going to be called Gleo, not Glee. Glee is the library for WebGL abstraction. Gleo is the one for maps, which maps, I haven't okay. released yet. Uh, I, I hope to be able to release it shortly. Uh, it's going to be hard GPL. Uh, why is it going to be hard GPL? I don't want to use hard GPL JavaScript libraries. Well, this is my response to Mapbox GL2. I don't want, uh, I am angry at Mapbox GL2 being completely closed source. So my response is, okay, I'm going to just throw a tantrum and license all my stuff as hard GPL, even for JavaScript. So. Uh, if this decision of mine is not okay with you, I will be happy to let you try and convince me why I should do something different than GPL, as long as it has some benefit for me, which at the moment I don't think it has or nobody has given me any um, well put together reason for this. I see. Well, I'm sure that people can find you in the conference and can discuss yes. it with you. Uh, um, in the links I pasted in the conference chat, you can find my contact details if you want them. So thank you. OK, perfect. Thank you for your talk, Ivan. And we will be seeing you in Fosfo G. Bye bye. Yes. See you soon. And now we will be setting up the next talk by, 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 sorry, by Stelios Vinalis. Uh, it will start in four minutes. So. See you soon.